several times over the years. He is down from uh, North Phoenix, is where he lives, and he has been very actively involved in Republican politics for years and years, and he is the person that has been up here showing us how to work the ALICE program, the Arizona Legislative Interactive System. ALIS. <laughs> Interactive system. Okay, and we will, you know, last year I tried to remember everything he had trained us and I tried to do it, but remember my new computer, you know, didn't pick it up and we had a bomb that day. So anyhow, we'll have to do that again. But anyhow, he sends out notices to me on Sunday nights and I forward them on Sunday nights or early Monday mornings to all of you. And he tells you what bills that are of interest to conservatives about education issues, about you know, any kind of issue that's going through the state legislature, what the committee meetings are going to be, what the dates of the committee meetings are. And through that ALICE system, you can get on and you can give uh, input to the people, the state legislators on either the House or the Senate committee at which that's being heard. And you can even, if you do it at the time, you can be, it can be seen live on their, their uh, screens of their computer screens during the meetings. Or you can just send out a notice that you support or oppose it, keep it simple, you know, and on whatever. And he gives you the bill numbers, you can click on the bill number, you can go to the bill, you can read the whole bill yourself. And uh, then there's a recommendation of how conservatives might want to vote on this. And sometimes he gives you hints like why this is a bad idea or why this is a good idea. So he has been extremely valuable to thousands and thousands of people in the state because you know the Democrats and the unions are making sure their people are contacting their state legislators. So that will be coming up when the session begins in January. Actually, I just got an email from him today, which I didn't get to finish reading. Do you want to tell us what that is all about? Uh, oh. Come on up and let's meet Jose Borajero, who is going to talk tonight. He is representing um, Lynn Weaver, who is the author of this um, founder of American Dream Act Arizona, which is the topic tonight is actually going to be about a program that is a, a statewide initiative that they're trying to collect signatures to get it on the ballot for November 2020. And it is about relieving seniors of any property tax burden so they own their house outright and they, they can, you know, not be foreclosed on or whatever because they haven't paid their property taxes. So it, this is what it's all about. And so he's going to give you all the fine prints about that. And so welcome, Jose. Yay. Okay, I will answer the uh, first question first. Yeah. yeah. Um, actually, before anything here. else, I, uh, I want to thank you uh, for that great introduction, Jeremy. Sharon. Um, Sharon. Don't Sharon. get blinded. And uh, <laughs> happy to be here. Uh, it's always good to come up from the People's Republic of Phoenix and yeah. uh, deal with some real people for a change. So, anyway, uh, I want that email that I sent out today. Uh, normally, I don't do anything to, uh, to any great extent uh, unless the legislature is in session. Uh, but today, is, it was kind of like a kickoff because it's going to be happening pretty soon. We're, we're, we're three months away, but uh, there's a lot of activity going on prior to the uh, opening of the session. One thing that is very important that's Hold happening. Yeah, there we go. One thing that um, that is happening that is very important is that many school districts are having a bond issue uh, uh, elections and uh, uh, budget override elections. So I have I have written a couple of articles regarding that subject. So I made reference to those articles so that you can you can have some information because the, for, the information about what's going on is pretty difficult to obtain. It's not that it's not available, it's just that you really have to search deep in order to put it together. So what I have done is I've put together some figures so that you know um, what's going on and uh, 
be a little easier to make up your mind as to whether you want to vote for or against the, the uh, override or the, uh, or the bond issue. I know that these, uh, <clears throat> these uh, taxes uh, have been increasing steadily over the years. Uh, my own, uh, and most of you probably got your, your statement about two or three weeks ago, uh, the tax bill view and so on. And I know that mine, the portion that goes to bonds, went up by 17%. Last year, it went up by 16%. Wow. So every year it goes up and up and up. And that, of course, is going to tie with what I'm going to be talking about tonight. Uh, <clears throat> so that's one of the things. The other thing that I mentioned in that email is that uh, naturally, I, I, I'm interested in the, uh, in the legislature, what's happening and what bills come up and so on. But also have an interest in, in, in seeing that some bills that I am interested in do get introduced. So there's a couple of uh, uh, groups that are uh, uh, putting together uh, <coughs> uh, information and, and suggestions about what bills to, uh, to introduce. And we have about two or three or four that we're working on. And uh, matter of fact, tomorrow I'll be meeting with three legislators. Uh, no, two legislators tomorrow, two, two sen one senator, one uh, representative. Uh, to talk about these bills. So, and that was the, uh, the uh, purpose of that, uh, of that email. Uh, <clears throat> as far as this... Do you want me to get you some water? I got water here. Okay. As far as this um, initiative, let's see if I can find my pointer here. Yeah, here we go. As far as uh, this initiative goes, for, the first thing I need to say about this is that the first thing that you learn if you're being taught how to speak in public or how to make a presentation, the first thing that you learn is that you never ever under any circumstances read the material because that's the surest way of putting the audience to sleep. But guess what? That's exactly what I'm going to be doing tonight. So I, I hope you had plenty of coffee. Now, yeah. th there's two reasons why that's going to happen. Number one is that I just put this together. Uh, this is the first time that I presented and I well, you guys are going to be the guinea pigs because I have no idea how, how, how long it takes. I know it's going to be short, uh, but I haven't, I haven't uh, uh, memorized uh, all the material, so I will be doing a lot of uh, reading so that you can bear with that. Uh, the other reason why I put it together this way is there is a lot of material, a lot of facts in the presentation, and I've done it, done it this way because I cannot travel that much to too many places. Uh, and some areas of the state are pretty, pretty far away from Phoenix. Mm -hmm. So I've, I've done it so that anyone can do this presentation. You have all the figures, all the numbers there, everything, all the questions, and that would be a fluid thing. As we get more questions from people, the frequently asked question list would increase. But what this does is that you can either read it uh, or somebody can present it. So what I'll do tonight is I'll I'll, I'll, <clears throat> I'll have a uh, Shirley uh, copy that uh, my presentation so that she has it available. She can distribute it any way she wants. And I've also, I also have, a, 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 have it in the format of uh, MS Word uh, document. Some people are not comfortable with PowerPoint, so they may just want to read it as a file, as a, a Word file. So, uh, so that's why it's, uh, it's going to be like that. Okay, uh, <clears throat> oh, and this is actually, it's intended to be just a summary, uh, the, uh, because you can get all this information and more by going to the website, which is right there, www.americanpremacaz.com. And again, that will be available when uh, uh, I'm sure we can have it and distribute it and what have you. Okay, let's get started. Next, okay. next slide. Let's get started. Did Next it go slide. there? <laughs> oh, shoot. I tell ya. We had it working. Okay, did, did, you, did you go to... Uh, oh, there you go. No, that... See, uh, it's, it's it, going there. It goes there, but not here. Yeah. All righty. Slideshow. Okay, on the top. Right there. You have slideshow that, yeah. Yeah. Okay, now try it. Mm -hmm. Come, come, come. 
Okay. Okay. All right, oh. we had it working here before. Okay, it was working before, it's not working now, so we go to plan B. If you can get it working, fine. If not... Okay, the first stop. Okay, folks, the, the first slide that deals with the problems, the reason why we are doing this in the first place is that there are certain problems that we're having regarding seniors and property taxes, okay? Uh, one of the things that happens is that, of course, your government has a lien on your property, just the same as a lender would. If the tax is not paid for whatever reason, they have, they have the power to collect, and if, he can, if they cannot collect, they have the power to repossess your home just like a banker would. So, it's important that, uh, that, that people be able to afford their taxes. <clears throat> the other thing regarding this is that property taxes are the darling of people who want to grow the government. The reason for that is that, for example, another source of uh, income or revenue would be uh, income tax but the income tax can fluctuate. Right. The economy is bad, income taxes go down because people make less money, etc. And the other one is, okay, we go back to plan A. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the other one is that uh, the sales tax is the same thing. Right. When there's less economic activity, there is less uh, uh, sales taxes that are collected. So those people who really want to have a steady source of revenue really like the idea of having a property tax because there's no way you can avoid the property tax. The only way that you can avoid it is either lose the house, sell it, that's about it, or whatever. As long as you own the property, you're gonna to have to pay the property tax. You cannot escape it. And they can increase it any time they want. Uh, a couple of years back, well, several years back, with great fanfare, the legislature passed a, a bill that was supposed to curb the growth of property taxes. But, but, the, the part that they did not, of course I knew and many people knew because you, we, we read bills, the part that we did not, that, that, that they did not tell you about is that they were doing only one portion and that is the, 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 uh, the value used for determining the tax. They did not do anything about the rate. So what happens is that it sounds good, it says my, my valuation cannot go up by more than 10% a year. Well, but your rate can go up. So what uh, these taxing authorities do, they say, okay, we need X number of dollars, and then they say, okay, so we'll just divide the property values versus, uh, with the rate and, and figure out how much money we're gonna collect. So, so we have that escalating of uh, property tax. <clears throat> okay, what are the other points? And this you probably cannot read in the back, so perhaps a good reason I'm reading. Um, oh yeah. Uh, it affects not just the senior citizen that's having difficulty. A lot of these senior citizens in, in the retirement with not a whole lot of savings, okay? And, and most everybody is on a fixed income. So the fact that the property tax keeps on going up and up and up, and income does not go up, creates a, a bad situation for a lot of uh, people who are retired. Yes, the part about the children and grandchildren. Uh, if you have a grandparent or a parent that's in this situation, you kind of feel obligated to kind of help them out. Uh, either either have them sell the house and come move with you, or help them financially so that they can go ahead and uh, and uh, and pay the tax. Uh, neither one of which is a palatable option for these kids. Uh, now, we have tried many many times to address this issue via the legislature. Every time that it's tried, it's failed. The last time that was it was tried is 2018, I believe. And my own senator, with the help of another senator, sought to it that it was killed. My own senator, by the way, is Heather Carter. Yeah. 
and the, the, the second senator was uh, K. Profit McGee. Mm -hmm. uh, two uh, two peas in a pod. So anyway, and, and with the legislature being as close as it is, all it takes is two Republican senators to change, mm -hmm. and you're dead. Mm -hmm. And the House is even worse because all it takes is one. We have only a majority of one. Mm -hmm. So if one re uh, Republican representative decides that they're going to go against the bill, in fact, they don't even have to go against the bill. If they fail to vote, if they just vote no vote, yeah. then we have only 30 votes, which, which makes the bill fail. So they don't even have to uh, 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 generate a, a no vote. We're in dark straits, folks, unless we get some more conservative uh, Republicans in the, uh, in the legislature. Okay, so much for that. So that's the problem, that's why we need to do this. Okay, so what, what is it that we're going to do? There we go. All right, <clears throat> there are certain rules as to who can qualify, who cannot qualify, what needs to be done, etc. Number one is that it applies only for people who have primary residency in Arizona, no rentals. If you have property that's a rental or if you're renting, of course this doesn't apply to you. Uh, if you have the primary residence in another state, again, it doesn't apply to you. It has to, you have to be a resident and paying taxes and, and make your primary residency in Arizona in order to qualify for, for this. Uh, <clears throat> of course, an application is required. You have to, oh, and you have to be a U.S. citizen. It doesn't matter whether you're naturalized or, 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 or born citizen, but you have to be a U.S. citizen. So no, no illegal aliens uh, would qualify. Uh, and you do have to submit an application to show that it, it, you are in fact over 65 and that, um, and that you are a U.S. Uh, US citizen. Uh, let's see, who else is not, okay, if, you, if your home is owned by a corporation or a society or LLC or whatever, uh, it, does not, uh, it does not qualify, it has to be an individual who owns the property and is paying the property tax. Uh, <clears throat> if there are multiple owners, for example, a husband and wife, and one is 65, but the other one is not. You can have the, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, you can participate. If one of those partners, or the husband or the wife, were to die or to separate, or for whatever reason not be part of it again, then the other, the second person, if he or she is 65, it continues. If they're younger than 65, they would have to start paying the property tax again until they do reach age 65 and be seniors, and be, they would be senior citizens, but be U.S. citizens and so on. Okay, so that, those are the, uh, basically the qualifications. And I will talk about the income qualifications, or lack of it in a minute. Yes? Don't they have a qualification for disabled? Not that I'm aware of. <clears throat> See, our county, but, but, has, our county has two different programs. Um, but one is not for disabled. Oh, okay, I'm, I'm not aware of All I'm yeah. aware of is that if this were to pass, then nobody who meets these qualifications would be uh, paying property tax. So if that disabled person is over 65, uh, again, they would qualify. If the person is uh, 50 or 60, then I, 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 it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be part of this. It may be a different program somewhere. Okay. Next, next. Uh, next slide. Okay, here we go with frequently asked questions. Number one, will schools or essential services lose revenue? And the answer is no. What's going to happen is that they will continue to spend the same amount regardless because that's the way they do it. A taxing <laughs> authority just decides how much you need, and, and that taxing authority can be a school uh, school board or a district or whatever. It doesn't matter. It will continue the same. However, because there are uh, individuals who would not be paying the tax, then there'll be a, a, loss of, uh, a loss of revenue that has to be made up somehow. Okay. I 
And I'll answer that question in a minute. I'm just going to go and don't in the order that I have this because we, I'm going to address what happens when people who are not yet 65 and, and, and what's in it for them. <clears throat> the other question that comes up quite often is that there is no income uh, requirement on this. And the objection there or the question is, okay, so you have all these wealthy senior citizens and, uh, and then now they're going to gonna get a free ride and that's not right because why, why should they... Uh, have a break when they don't really need it. All of that is true, but when you start actually talking about facts and numbers and figures, it so happens that uh, the amount of those individuals who are actually individual homeowners who actually are, uh, whose main residence is in Arizona, if they're not snowbirds and have a home, the main home in Colorado or New York or whatever, the number is relatively low. In fact, if they were to be excluded, the cost of vetting everybody to find out who is wealthy and who is not uh, would be higher than the additional tax that would be collected from those individuals. Number one. Number two, we really don't want to run those people off the state because uh, they do pay, if they are, if they have the prime residence in, in Arizona, they do pay income tax and they do buy things and pay sales tax. So they do contribute to the economy to a, to a fairly large extent. They spend a lot of money here. So that's the reason or the, the, the reasons why the, uh, the wealthy uh, senior citizens are not excluded in this. Okay, I think that pretty much covered that. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, I already answered this. Uh, with the property tax increase for those under 65, and the answer is definitely yes. The, pro the thing, though, is that it is extremely difficult to find, to get figures on these, okay? So all we can do is make a, an estimate as to what may happen. And the estimate that I'm told that has resulted from all this research is that the amount that each individual on the, on the 65 would be paid in terms of additional property tax would run somewhere between 10 and $100 a year, which is very minor compared, and again, that's because you have so few senior citizens who are uh, eligible for this versus the total number of people paying the, yeah, paying the tax. And the next question is one that, again, that comes up quite often. Uh, <clears throat> so, so you're nowhere near age 65, what's in it for you? Well, number one, if you do have a parent or a grandparent that is in peril, uh, you would feel obligated to somehow help those folks. And this would remove that, uh, that burden. Uh, but even more important is the fact that this would be a good investment if you look at it from a monetary point of view. Because if you're paying extra for a few years until you reach age 65, and then when you reach age 65, you no longer pay property tax, uh, you probably you probably make up the difference in one or two years. Okay, so uh, it's good investment. It's it's like buying an insurance policy that would guarantee that that you would have. No taxes once you reach age 65. So you pay for a while, uh, depending on your age, and then, uh, and then you're rewarded with, uh, with that. Um, let's see, what else can I say about that? Yeah, the additional tax will be reput the first two years after you reach age 65. Uh, another slide? And, and if you have more questions, I'm open to, to answer all the questions as well. But, um, yeah, will this be there when you reach 60? <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay, so I'm saying, to, I'm saying to you, okay, so you pay for you know 20 years and then you're gonna recoup it in two or three years once you reach age 65. Oops, it's no longer available. Okay, this is a constitutional amendment, okay? It's a citizen-initiated constitutional amendment. That means that the only way, that the legislature cannot tamper with this in any way, shape, or form. They cannot do a thing to it. Nobody can do a thing to it once it's passed. 
except this, that you would have to have another initiative, get signatures, and get the votes of the people in order to make any change, such as eliminating the program. I don't know of any constitutional amendment that was installed and that then was reversed by the vote of the people subsequently. There may have been some, but I've never heard of one. So once this thing is in place, it's, it's as guaranteed as anything else can be guaranteed that you will have it when you reach age 65. And I guess that, uh, that's all I have to say about that. Oh, <laughs> I already had a pretty good plug regarding my, my, my organization, but I put it there anyway, uh, not knowing that, uh, that I was gonna get it. Uh, my, my team, uh, if you were to, to, uh, to join, and many of you have joined indirectly uh, because you get, uh, you get her emails, I send it to her and then she redistributes it to other people. Occasionally I get somebody who says, no, I don't want to do it that way, I want to get it a little sooner, so I want, I want to be on the list myself. Okay, other people may say, look, no sense in sending me emails because I have access to Facebook and I can get the information there. So uh, there's, there's a couple of ways you can get this information. And one is go to Facebook right there, or be on my uh, distribution list. Or uh, have somebody who is on the distribution list that sends them to you. And what you get is what, uh, what has already been mentioned, uh, weekly alerts uh, regarding pending legislation, weekly reports as to how the votes went, uh, useful information to determine whether to support uh, incumbent. Now this is important because if you know how the people, if you know an incumbent, you know how that person voted, then, then you can make an intelligent decision as to whether you want to vote for that person or vote for a, uh, for a challenger, okay? We have that situation right now in my own district where we have somebody challenging in the primary, an individual who actually has a awful, rotten uh, voting record. Robert Graham. Oh. No. It, no, he's running no. for House. No, he's running for the House. Yeah, okay, so. I am talking about our Heather senator, Carter. Heather, uh, Heather Carter. Carter. Yeah. yeah. As a matter of fact, I just got Everyone. through putting together a, uh, <laughs> uh, putting She's together bad. some of her votes yeah. and uh, some of her horrible Boom. She had about eight of those in 2019, and uh, 2018 was a um, 2018 was a uh, an election year, so she cooled it a little bit. She didn't have too much there. But 2017, she went um, she went to town with it, with her with her uh, uh, antics. So she is she's a pretty bad one. Now, before I leave this subject, I should mention it's generally not a good idea, especially when the legislature is so tight now that, you, that our majority is so thin that we could lose it any time. In fact, we're in real danger of losing it this coming cycle. So it's not a good idea to primary a Republican, generally speaking, because it could, that seat could end up in the hands of a Democrat. So I'll give you two examples, one where it can be done and should be done and one where it shouldn't. The one where it should not be done is in the case of Kate Brophy McGee, who has a record which is almost as bad as Heather Carter, okay? <clears throat> but she's in a district which is kind of a mixed district. If we get rid of her, there is a good possibility that we will lose that seat to a Democrat. So it's not a good idea to try to primary her, all right? Isn't Heather Carter trying to primary her? No, Wait a second. No, no, no. Okay. No. Two different, two different, two, two, two uh, different situations. Two different districts. Two different districts. Two different districts. Okay. Heather Carter is in District 15, which happens to be my district. Okay. That district was gerrymandered. Remember, when they gerrymandered these districts, if, if they want to put a whole bunch of Democrats in one district, well, they have to put the Republicans someplace. Mm -hmm. And one of those dumping places happened to be LB15. So it's virtually impossible for a Democrat to get elected in District 15. I don't think that anybody has been elected in that area since the earth was flat. So, uh, so it, is, it, it is a safe Republican uh, uh, seat. In that situation, then it is relatively safe for somebody to challenge that an incumbent Republican because the chances of losing that seat to a Democrat are extremely low, if not impossible. And that's exactly what's happening. We have a current, current uh, uh, representative who used to be a senator and then turned limited out in the Senate and went to the House. Her name is uh, uh, Bartow. 
uh, and uh, and she's uh, she's uh, now uh, challenging uh, Heather Carter for that uh, that seat, and uh, some of us are working for a vision to make Marco that happen. Nancy. So. I mentioned that it is a short presentation. There isn't that much to it, but you guys may have some additional questions. Yes, ma'am. How many valid signatures are required to put this on the ballot? And what is the status of the signature gathering at this time? I can answer the first question. I cannot answer the second one. <laughs> the first question is a lot. 350 some thousand signatures. Okay. That's because it's statewide and it is a constitutional amendment. It, it, it requires the highest number of signatures in order to put it on the ballot. So we need a lot of help to, uh, to actually get it on, on the ballot. And it's going to be fought to the nail by certain organizations that are taking of their gaming the system now. Uh, some business organizations, they have all kinds of, um, all kinds of sweet deals. Oh, that's another thing I did not mention earlier. Uh, if you're talking about, okay, how much money we're going to lose, how much revenue are we going to lose as a result of this, it's not nearly as much as we lose by all these sweetheart deals that we have with, with uh, certain businesses and business organizations, because everybody gets a tax break here and there if, elsewhere. And uh, so this would be only another, well, it would be another break on the wall, but uh, not, not that much more, or maybe not even as much. But anyway, it's going to be fought uh, uh, to the nail by these organizations, so it's going to it's going to have a rough ride at best. So, it, yes. Who is uh, uh, bringing this uh, forward, and who's sponsoring it, and who's backing it, paying for it? I don't know who's paying for it. It's uh, important, you know. <laughs> yeah, but I don't know. Um, Lynn Weaver is the spearhead of this. Uh, she's the one up front. Uh, who, who's financing whatever financing there is, I have no idea. They, as far as I know, they're intending to do this mostly with uh, volunteers, which would be a difficult task. Uh, because Still have to pay for advertising and uh, promotions. And right, that would come once you have the signature. Once you have the signature, then you can start uh, uh, trying to get the votes. And of course, so they're not going to pay for, for people to get signatures? Well, they may or may not. I don't know. I don't know. Um, Jose, I was kind of very um, suspicious is not the word, um, but concerned. reluctant and concerned it? about this. And because I've seen Lynn advertising this on Republican briefs and stuff for months and months and months. Then we had Russell Pierce up here. Uh, as a presenter, and he mentioned it and was all for it. And people go, well, you know, if Russell Pierce is for it, maybe this isn't such a bad idea. However, last week, we had our county assessor up here talking, because we are in an override situation here, and he was talking about the difference between um, market value and What's my word, guys? I'm assessed. tired. Assessed. assessed valuation. And he broke it all down, your assessed valuation and 10%. And what, you know, this is what your tax is based on, is your assessed valuation. And we asked him about this, seeing as you guys, you were coming up here. And he said Lynn Weaver and all had come to all of the different counties. Now, down where you live, you got thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of homes they could take up the slack. But here, we only have 3% private property in our whole county because we're forest service all around. <coughs> and 50% of the people here in Payson are over 55 and the great majority, uh, you know, like 40% or over 65. So when you're taking 40% of the people that would qualify off the rolls, then where do we get our I, our property tax for our schools, you know, well, we would get equalization funds from down in the valley, but um, it, it just kind of makes me a little crazy about all our fire districts and our school district and our, you know, 
transportation, you know, our districts in the town and all that stuff, how they would get paid if we're, you know, because there's a lot of poor, poor people, you know, that and older people down in Globe also. Uh, yeah. Uh, the, the, the bottom line there is that you may be in a situation where you think it's wiser not to uh, pursue this. Uh, all we can do is show you the, 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 the argument one way or the other. You, mm -hmm. you hear arguments on one side, you hear arguments from the other side, and decide for yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, there may be, maybe this is not a good county for it. I don't know. Based on what you're saying, there's a very slim chance that it will not, it will not, it will not contribute very much to putting it on the ballot, and if it does, that there will not be that many people voting for it. Yeah. I don't know. All I can do is show you what the uh, what the argument is, and you make up your own mind. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir, back there. Okay. Thank you for coming. You know, one of the principles of the Tea Party is smaller government with no less taxes. But then we get a group that comes around and and they want an override tax increase, and they say, "Oh, if you vote against us, you're against our kids." You know, it's like being against. Motherhood, apple pie, and children. And about half of our people, are, or some of them, just melt and go ahead and raise the taxes. And what do you think about this override election? I have never, ever been in favor of an override. I don't know if most people realize that the override has to do with what is called the DAA, which is the... Um, District Additional District. Assistance. Huh? District as additional assistance, assistance, which is something that it comes from the uh, from the state funds, but is supposed to help with uh, certain uh, areas in the uh, that would normally be a bond issue type of thing because it has to do with capital improvements and that sort of thing. Uh, the argument that they use is that this DAA is not fully funded, and therefore we need this because the bad guys in Phoenix. We don't want us to have this extra money that we need here. The fact is that, yes, we, are, we have not reached the level that they want, the, the, the level that was scheduled, but it is scheduled to be caught up in about two or three years because we keep on increasing it every year. The other fact that, that people do not realize when, or well, they, they, they conveniently forget, is the fact that the legislature has been increasing funding for schools, funding for education in general, exponentially almost, okay? This, this last session, we saw a, an 11% increase in school funding. The previous session, we saw a 10% increase. If you go to my, uh, to my uh, Facebook page, A-Z-R-R-T, there are several articles uh, I've written two of them, providing these kinds of figures. Uh, figures as to what kind of bonds these school districts have now, how much they're asking for, and then I have uh, information uh, as to exactly how much funding has been, uh, has been uh, provided for education over the last uh, uh, 20, or so, 30, uh, 20 or 30 years, I forget how long. These figures are available from the legislature um, committee, okay, J JLC, the, something like that. Anyway, there, there is a committee in, in, the, uh, in the legislature that publishes these figures, but the report is many pages long and it, it includes everything. So weighing through that, it's kind of difficult. Trying to, to extract, you know, how much is being spent on education is, is not easy, and the average individual is not going to spend a whole lot of time doing that or say forget it. Mm -hmm. What I have done is that I have done that, and I have listed every year how, much, how many billions of dollars went to education. And when people say that the legislature is not doing their share, they're lying to you. They're lying to you. Uh, one thing that people in this situation say to us, they say, well, we, we demand funding to the, le the pre-recession level. We got to have that. And our 
um, superintending of public instruction uh, about a week or two ago made such a statement that we need to go back to the level that it was before the uh, recession. Guess what? We're above the level that we were before the recession. Okay? By about a billion dollars. Okay? But they still, you know, ringing the same bell, telling you the same lies. And the other thing that they don't tell you about is that those levels in 2006, 2007, just before, just before the recession, school funding, education funding went up by one year, it went up 15%, another year went up 10%. And everybody knew that we were going to have a recession. The signs were very clear. In fact, the first year of the recession, which was 2008, the legislature increased funding for, for education by 3%. Now, 3% is not a big increase, but at that time, everybody else was taking a cut. And then, of course, in 2009, 2010, the bottom fell out, and, of course, everybody was cut back. Okay? And uh, so, it, nobody picked on education, it's just that everybody was cut back. And then, slowly over the years, and, and, and faster for education than anything else, you see the, the line increasing, increasing, increasing. And right now, as I said earlier, the, it's about $6.4 billion that we're spending on, uh, on education now, uh, which constitutes over 50% of the state budget. It's another thing. You have over 50%. The, the state budget was, what, $11 billion? Okay. And you have six billion going to education, okay? They should be, they should be, they should be out in the streets thanking yeah. the legislature for what they did, yeah. as opposed to rioting and, uh, and demanding more and more and more. Uh, whenever somebody asks me uh, how much, whenever I ask the, a question of, uh, to a member of a school board or any of these uh, that I call educrats. Uh, how much is enough? How much is it that you, that you need? They never give me a straight answer. So I have my tongue-in-cheek comment that, that is, well, the answer to that question is as much as they can extract from valuable taxpayers. But the reality is that it's not that much of a tongue-in-cheek. I mean, it's pretty much reality because that's exactly what it is. They'll get as much as they can get away with. And they lie about it. And, uh, and that's, that's just... But people, you know, they say it's for the children and people don't bother reading the, the, the facts and figures and then they vote uh, themselves a tax increase every time. Any other questions? I'd just like to uh, share. I'm sorry our, our roving mics are down, guys, so we'll, if you're speaking, speak loud enough. Um, I've served on our school board and I was a budget hawk on the school board and one of the problems that I see with our specific override that started in 2008 when the things, economy was down and all that, is we cannot do zero-based budgeting because statewide all the school districts have to do it the exact same way. And so whenever we were doing budget, we're saying, well, we're going to have to take so much money from here and put it over here. And I'm going, well, what's being spent underneath all this that you're just, you know, the rest of the line items in that budget line. Mm -hmm. And there's not a whole lot you can move around because of the different categories and stuff. But, um, so one of the things, um, like my, in my tax bill, the, you know, it was, uh, it was $87 in, in 2017, then it was, I think, 90. For the school? Yeah, it went up three, in my latest tax bill, it went up all three dollars for the year for the continuation of the override because the property valuation went up. Actually, the tax rate for the override went down a little bit. So, um, but anyhow, so I, I've told everybody, don't just listen to me because I've, you know, I've been pr somewhat promoting the override continuation because it's one that we've already we've been paying, and yes, it could go away in three years, but one of the things that happened here in the state of Arizona when I was on the school board is we got the um, minimum wage went from 8.25 an hour, and now in next January, it'll be $12 an hour. 
So all of our affiliated staff, our custodians, our bus drivers, our aides, all of those, uh, our parapros, all those people that were making eight or nine dollars an hour, depending on how qualified they were, now had to be raised up all the time. Voter initiative. Huh? It was a voter initiative. Yes, in it was. In the Constitution. I know, and we... Don't we, you love it? Yeah, in the Constitution. It never can be changed, okay? So... Well, quite, well, quite, quite honestly, I'm not a fan of... <laughs> I'm not a fan of these initiatives. No, I'm not there's, a fan there's, of initiatives There's, there's two reasons why I'm not a fan of it. Um, and one is that I find that, uh, that not to my liking that 50% plus one uh, can institute a, uh, a constitutional amendment. Mm -hmm. A constitutional amendment should be a lot harder than that. Yeah. Right. And number two is that once you have an initiative in place, there's no, it has to be voted either up or down. There is no negotiation, there's no, uh, there's no give and take. Uh, if, if there's no amendments, if, if there was a problem that somebody did not notice at first, then that problem will remain throughout. You're stuck with it. So you, yeah, you, you, are, you are stuck with it. Mm -hmm. However, we do have the initiative process in, 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 in effect. So since we have it and it's used in many ways, uh, then of course we'll continue to use it as long as it's, as, as it's, uh, as it's there. Mm -hmm. But uh, it's, I, I don't think it's overall it's a good idea. So anyhow, I said, but you know, that has added a lot to the budget so that the specific programs that our override pays for, they couldn't actually pay for it out of the regular MNO budget, you know, because the budget costs, even though we got all this money for the teachers, all the classified people had to get raises and raises and raises too. Mm. So the you know, problem. Uh, one thing, and I don't know if that's the case here, but one of the problems that I see in, in, in many of Phoenix districts is that they spend an inordinate amount of money on buildings. And uh, we don't. Uh, yeah, I, I don't know what it is up here, but down in, in Phoenix, all you have to do is go to one of the district schools. And for example, in, in my neighborhood, we have the uh, PBUSD uh, high school. And you look at those buildings, and then you go down 32nd Street and look at a, um, a charter school uh, building. And the charter school building was prefab, you know, very cheap, yet it does the purpose. It houses the kids, and they, and they are able to, 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 uh, to, to do business. While this, the, the district school, is, it's, uh, they have all these, well, they have uh, solar panels, they, they replace tiles with, uh, with uh, uh, ecosystem uh, friendly tiles just because they want to do it, just because they have the money. They do all kinds of ridiculous things. And, uh, and the people pay for it. Yes, sir, you have a question? You see, I know that and I have a lot of respect for Shirley's opinion, but talking about going to $12 an hour minimum wage, they've been paying that over McDonald's for flipping hamburgers for some time. Now, I think that the, we were due to pay bus drivers and so many people more money than ten dollars an hour because of the we, we felt enough about our, our city manager getting more than the governor yeah. and some of these positions were way overpaid so there's no balance in there yes we need fire and police and some of these minimum wages caught up and that way we will maintain the qualified people that we try to get here instead of this big turtle. Mm. Okay. But we, I don't think we need more taxes to do it. <laughs> yeah, well, I want to say something. Yes. <clears throat> Thank you for trying to get this initiative through. I appreciate that. And I probably won't have any friends left when I say this, but, you know, in America, we don't own anything. Uh, we have a house. Maybe we're paying for it. Maybe it's paid. We have a car. Uh, those things we try to keep for a while. Both of them are licensed or taxed in some form or another. And um, the other stuff we own is all wood, hay, and stubble. We have to replace every time something wears out. So we have that kind of thing. But you, we need to discern what kind of spirit is property tax. And that spirit is the same spirit 
that the mafia has when they go to your business and say either you give us this money every month or we're going to come and destroy your property or we're going to come and even take your life. And that's called extortion. That's what it's called. And extortion is when you uh, demand and take things by force. By force. That's what it's called. And so you're forced to pay these property taxes. If you don't pay the license on your car, that car better be sitting in the garage because the minute you put it on the street, it's going to cost you money and maybe even jail time. Who knows? The same thing with your house. You don't pay those property taxes. It doesn't matter how old you are, how disabled you are, or anything else. You're out of there, and that house now belongs to the state. So it's extortion. Any way you look at it, property tax is extortion. Right now in America, we're trying to change the corruption in our nation and in our government. And I think a vote for this, even though it is ground floor, I think a vote for this would help do the morally right thing. And so, and as far as schools, <clears throat> I know that property tax goes to more than just the school tax. But I personally resent, love all people, but I personally resent paying property taxes to help educate hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of illegal children in this country. And uh, so we need to stop this nonsense of corruption in our own government, and thank you for trying to get this through. One, one thing that you may not, uh, may not have noticed, uh, uh, in, but, but, but you will if, if you look carefully at your property tax statement. And that is that, I, well, I cannot speak for anybody else, but uh, in my, uh, my own district, the, the amount, the percentage of the property tax that goes to education is 60%. And there is a line there that reduces the, the stated amount because of some help from the, uh, from the state uh, government. If you take that away, then the percentage is 77%. So that's how much of my property tax is going to finance education. If you look at, and by the way, uh, I'm in, uh, in Maricopa County, so this doesn't apply to you guys, but we have an excellent, excellent uh, uh, county uh, 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 treasurer in, in Royce, Florida. Uh, and, and he's assisted by Russell, Russell Pierce. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know if you guys know that he's an assistant treasurer. But anyway, uh, the, our property tax statement is extremely transparent. Mm -hmm. You can find out a lot, a lot of stuff in the Maricopa County property tax statement. I cannot speak for any other counties, but that's the way it is in Maricopa County. And that's how we know these things. That's how I know these things. I look at the, I look at the, uh, at the. Uh, statement and I and I see and it, it has it broken down and says okay uh, how much of your property tax who put who put that tax there what district did this okay and lo and behold the number two uh, as far as how much they put onto my uh, my property tax is the people voter approved uh, increases okay the number one was the school board. Okay. <laughs> that was that was number one. Uh, so if you if you look at your property tax, then it makes it a lot easier. To take a close look at your property tax statement, then it makes it a lot easier as to whether you want to have a vote for or against an override for or against a, a bond issue. Yeah. yeah, well you do have to do a little bit of that. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. Oh, yes. I think you said you needed 350,000 signatures to get it on. Give, give, give or take. I think it's 353 or something. So say it gets on the ballot in 2020. Um, is it just a straight majority vote? Or yes. Or you need more than that? No, it's straight not majority. Okay. And that's one of my objections to the initiative in the first place, that, that I think that uh, I don't like the idea of 50% uh, plus one uh, majority, simple majority, can change the Constitution. In this case, I'm in favor of it because I think it's a good initiative, 
but in general, I'm not I'm not crazy about initiative for that reason. So, anything else? Okay. Well, thank you very much. Appreciate you. <laughs>